word of sin and darkness. His love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be saved. done for me Who brings our chaos back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter The King of glory The King above all kings Who rules the nation with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of his brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. And this is unfailing love. That you will take my place. That you will bear my cross. You lay down your life And I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Yeah, this is amazing grace, and this is unfair. Provider, the 
Yes, you are protector. You are the one I love. And I believe in you are the way and the truth and the life. Yes, I believe in you are the way and the truth and the life. I believe. You are. Oh, I believe you are. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me every morning with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts. They will fade from you Because they have no power When I am trusting you It's a new horizon And I'm set on you And you meet me every morning With mercies that are new All my fears and doubts They will fade from you Because they can't control me and I believe you are the way, the, way, the, truth, the truth, and the life. And the life. Oh, I believe you are the way, the, way, the, truth, the truth, and the life. And the life. I believe you are. is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Let's sing those words together now from the heart. is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken, oh, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he never let me down, he's faithful to So why would he fail now? He won't. 
your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God love your voice for you have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other i know you as my father and i know you as my friend i have lived in the goodness of god is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. When my life is laid down, I'm surrendering now. I give you everything. Oh, your goodness is running after, is running after me. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God oh, All my life And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of Yes, we live. 
A few weeks ago, I began a series that I called Living a Grace-Filled Life. In the first message that I gave, I took the words of Jesus Christ uh, of the contrast of the two gates. 
Broad is the way that leads to the destruction, narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few find it. And one of the reasons that most people never find the narrow gate is I believe that the key word on the narrow gate is grace. And that men's propensity to be religious causes him to reject God's grace, the unmerited, unearned favor of God. Paul makes it provocatively clear in Ephesians 2 that we are saved by grace through faith and that salvation is a gift of God. It's not of works, he says, and that anyone should be able to boast. Secondly, I spoke of the greatness of God's grace. And I said at that time that we are all Barnabas, waiting for justice. And then we hear the words that Jesus Christ died in our place, and that's when grace happens. Grace is everything Jesus. We should be overwhelmingly grateful for God's grace. Grace cascades from the throne of God. In Timothy chapter 1, it says his grace is exceedingly abundant. In 2 Corinthians 9, 14, his grace is indescribable. He doesn't just love us. According to 1 John 3, he lavishes love on us. He doesn't dole out wisdom to us. He gives generously to all without finding fault, according to James 1. He is rich in kindness and tolerance and patience in Romans 2.4. He bestows abundant blessings on us. And that's hard for us to understand. We don't really get it. There must be something more. Or somehow we believe that we're doing God a favor because we put our faith and trust in him. Peter said in Matthew 19, he said, see, he's talking to Jesus. We have left all and followed you. What's in it for us? Think of that statement. We have left everything to follow you. What do we get out of this? Jesus replied and said to him that you shall receive a hundredfold and I'll throw in eternal life. Wow. Jesus promised a gain of 10,000%. Even Apple can't do that. A 10,000% gain. You see, God doesn't dispense grace with an eyedropper. He dispenses it with a fire hose. If our heart were a Dixie cup, God's grace is the Gulf of Mexico. Isn't that wonderful? You see, isn't that wonderful? But Jesus tells his disciples something else in Matthew chapter 10, and he said this, freely you received. Freely give. That's what I want to talk about this morning. The grace given, give grace. And that's you and me. Hmm. Wow. It's an amazing thing when we think about it from that point of view of what he has done. I want you to turn with me to Luke 19. The first example of this, Luke 19. Familiar story. Jesus is heading to Jerusalem for the final time. He's going through Jericho. He's crossed the Jordan. He's going through Jericho and then those 17 miles to Jerusalem. In verse 1 of Luke 19, it says, He entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. He was rich. Now, you can be rich just being a tax collector. A tax collectors are all pretty wealthy. What Rome did to any tax collector was 
They told the tax collector how much Rome wanted in taxes received, but the tax collector could add any amount of tax he felt the people would pay and keep it for himself. So tax gatherers are pretty good, but if you had a whole group of tax gatherers, then you're called the chief tax gatherer. So that's who Zacchaeus is. He is rich. He's country club rich. Four stall garage, rich. Manicured nails, rich. But I believe he was guilty rich. You see, he was viewed as a traitor to his own people. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. And he ran ahead and he climbed into the sycamore tree in order to see him as he was about to pass through that way. My scene here must be, in my mind, sort of like a Mardi Gras parade. Okay? And if you're in a Mardi Gras parade and you're short and you're six people deep, you're not seeing much at all. And by the way, how do you think the people of Jericho felt about Zacchaeus? Oh, wait, let him come up front. We want him. They just got shoulder to shoulder. We're not letting this guy see Jesus. And so that's what happens. And it says, and he ran ahead and he climbs in the sycamore tree. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up to him and says, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down. Today I must spend the stay. I must stay, he said, at your house. <laughs> I can't even imagine what Zacchaeus was thinking. Me? Why, why me? I mean, there's all these people. He looks in a tree and he says this to Zacchaeus. Of all the houses in Jericho, you're going to come to my house? A person who lived in Jericho would never set in, foot in his house. He was a traitor to his people. Hmm. What happens here? Grace walks in the front door of his life. Notice, he hurried, he came down, and he received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble and say, wait, he has gone to the gust of a man who is a sinner. That's what grace always does, by the way. Grace only applies to people who are sinners. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's all of us, isn't it? Yeah. Zacchaeus stopped and said, Lord, behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone, anything, I'll give him back four times as much. Grace walked in the front door of his life, and selfishness walked out the back door. The grace given, give grace. And this is exactly what Zacchaeus does. Wow. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save those who are lost. Hmm. That was amazingly generous for a man who's been saved for maybe minutes. But the grace given, give grace. Let me ask you this question. When has your generosity stunned somebody? Stunned them. Because how generous you are. It's an interesting question, isn't it? The grace given, give grace. See, this is a little bit difficult for us. We're very good at receiving grace, and we're very grateful. But the giving of grace, that's a little harder for us. <clears throat> in fact, the Bible anticipates that. Do you remember the parable of Jesus, the ungrateful servant? Yeah. He's so happy that grace visits him and he receives it all and his debt is removed. And he's as happy as a person could possibly be. But then when someone owes him a lot less, what did he do? You see, he's ungrateful. The grace giving of grace. Hmm. Which are you? Hmm. 
Maybe for some of us, we need to do what Peter said in 2 Peter 3. We need to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Maybe it's something we need to do that way. Jesus wants to us, and he certainly wants his disciples to learn this no matter what. Turn with me now to John 13. John 13. And we'll look at verse 1 to set the setting. Night before the crucifixion, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come and that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved him to the end. And during supper, the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, he got up from supper, and he laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Hmm. Does Jesus know who he is? He's the king of the universe. He's the son of God. And I love the word, John. He took off his robe. He knows who he is. And he wraps a towel around himself. Wow. Hmm. And then it says, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with a towel, which he was girded. That's an amazing thing. Of all things, feet, stinking, smelly, disgusting, feet. By the way, and especially so in this culture, all sewage is thrown into the streets. All they wore was open sandals. So you can imagine what the feet look like. Hmm. How many of you have a picture of the feet of somebody you love that you could show me afterwards? I got a picture. Look at these feet. You don't take pictures of feet, do you? No. I mean, it's an amazing thing. I remember somebody I went with church, to church with in Pennsylvania, and it turned out he was studying medicine. He was going to be a podiatrist. And he played left field, and I played center field in our church softball team. And I remember thinking, golly, for the next 30, 40 years, this guy's life always going to look at his feet. <laughs> wow. It's amazing. See, I don't think we mind shaking hands or hugging a person, even wiping the tear off a child's face. But wash feet? Come on. And Jesus knows he comes from God. He knows he's going to God. He knows that if he would just clear his throat, <clears throat> a myriad of angels would come and do his work. That's all he had to do. Hmm. He had all the authority that he could possibly have, and he exchanged his robe for a servant's wrap. He lowered himself to knee level, and he began to wipe away the grime and the grit and the grunge of their feet. I've said it before when I've taught this. It's the lowest servant's job possible. But I want you to understand something else. When they got into that room, the basin was there, the water's there, and the towel's there. Hmm. What are the disciples thinking? I'm not doing that. I'm not that lowest servant. I hope somebody comes along and does this, but I'm not doing it. Someone came along. The Son of God. Wow. And he washes their feet. He doesn't exclude anybody. I mean, think of this. He's going to wash their feet. Philip. Philip was the guy that said, when Jesus said, we're going to feed all these people, Philip's like, I don't think you understand math. You can't, we don't, we can't possibly feed all these people. 
Doubting Thomas. That, who would like that name for a couple thousand years? I don't think you're allowed to call him that in heaven. Are you doubting Thomas? James and John. Hey, we want to be in top men in the kingdom. We want to be prime minister with left and right hand. And, and by the way, if you won't listen to us, we'll send our mommy so that she'll plead our case. Peter, foot and mouth disease, over and over again, who says to Jesus, you can't be crucified. I will not allow you to be crucified. Wow. That very night, he's going to deny the Lord three times and curse the Lord on the third time. And all of them are better than when you think of Judas, conniving, greedy rat, who sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. He washed all their feet. Hmm. If he could wash the feet of his Judas, can you wash the feet of yours? No. You see, most people don't want to do that. But let me tell you something this morning. You're not most people. You're a child of God. Saved by grace. And the grace given, give grace. After Jesus just goes through with this, notice what he says then. Down at verse, thir- verse 12. So when he had washed their feet and taken their garments and reclined at the table, he said to them, Do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher, rabbi, and Lord, Corios. And you're right, for I am so. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. By the way, some churches have said, this is where he installed another ordinance called foot washing. And so some churches have foot washing along with the Lord's table and baptism. The symbolism would be okay, but it's not an ordinance. And by the way, even in places where you're going to have foot washing, you're missing the point. You see, if I said next Sunday we're going to have people's feet washed here, and You guys right here in the center section, first eight rows, you're going to come Sunday morning and we're going to wash your feet. So tell me how you prepare your feet to get washed, right? Trim the nails, clean them. You want want this to look as good as... That's not what happened here. He's using this as a metaphor. This was disgusting. This was an action where he showed grace to those who didn't deserve it. And he says, that's the example that I have for you. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, listen as I read, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. Why are the grace given not often grace givers? Root of bitterness. You see, they get a root of bitterness. They've been hurt. You see, the idea behind this is that, you know, grace isn't blind. Jesus understood everything. He sees the hurt. Grace sees sin. There's no doubt about it. But grace chooses to see God's forgiveness even more. And wherever grace abounds, forgiveness abounds as well. Over and over again, I've encountered people in all these years of ministry that just cannot get over their hurts. They constantly regurgitate their hurts. <laughs> they never escape. They never allow their hurts to escape their thought life. It's always right there. When you bore grudges that long and in that way, you suck the life out of yourself. And all you're left with is what the writer of Hebrews said, bitterness. That's all you have. You see, Jesus gives grace. We receive it. 
Jesus washes feet, we wash next. Jesus demonstrates grace, so we follow Jesus. The grace given, give grace. <laughs> Let's look at a personal level of this. Second Samuel, Old Testament, Second Samuel chapter 4. Now, at this stage, Saul and his son, Jonathan, who was David's BFF, okay, they're dead. They died in battle. David is now going to be king. Now, you have to understand the way all cultures worked in that part of the world at that time. Whenever someone else became king, the first thing that you always do is you kill every possible heir of the last king. They all die. There's nobody who can claim the throne left. That's the way this whole thing works. And so what ended up happening in this case was that, if you see it in verse 4 of chapter 4 of 2 Samuel, now Jonathan's, now Jonathan saw son had a crippled, had a son crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the report of Saul and Jonathan came to Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened that in her hurry to flee, he fell and became lame, and his name is Mephibosheth. She's trying to run and hide the boy, because he's going to die. But she drops him and apparently cripples both of his feet. (laughs) Please understand within the culture, too, what that means. If you have crippled feet in that culture, you are cursed by God. That's God's curse on you. And the only way you could stay alive normally with crippled feet would be to be a beggar and hope that other people would give you enough to sustain your life. So that's this boy's situation right now. Let's over chapter 5. At chapter 5. And here you see in verse 4, David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. Tremendous king. Israel's greatest king. 30 years old, he reigns for 40 more. So that's the backdrop. Now go with me to chapter 9 and verse 1. As we move on in this story, it says, Then David said, Is there yet anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake, who he loved? That word kindness is hesed. I beat this dog every time we come here. But that is the greatest word in the Hebrew language. Hesed. It means kindness, mercy, grace, loyalty, love, forgiveness, it is the great word for God's nature in the Old Testament. He said, there's anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David, and the king said to him, are you Ziba? He said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not anyone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. It's crippled in his feet. David has sort of a yes face here. Ziba has sort of a no face. See, Ziba's view is, why would you want, why do you want to know about someone who's cursed by God? Why would you want to know that? He's crippled. He's been cursed. Hmm. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. So he finds himself, he says, in Lodabar. Lodabar means the barren place. No one goes to live in a barren place. There's no pastures. 
for livestock, and there's no good soil for crops. So she took him, apparently, to Lodabar, a barren place, because he might be able to hide out there and may be able to live. <clears throat> Amazing. One thing else amazes me here. Then David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Notice when David is once the deuce manifest the grace of God to someone else, there's no stipulations. He didn't say, wait, you mean he's crippled? No. David never even mentions it. You see, the grace given give grace. Now watch. He said, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, who came to David, fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he said to David, here is your servant. But he didn't say it like that. Mephibosheth. <laughs> Here's your servant. <laughs> He's terrified. He's going to die right there. It wasn't like, hey, here's your servant. It doesn't work like that. He has no idea, but he knows now David's found him and brought him here. <laughs> wow. David said to him, notice, do not fear. David knows he's afraid. He's terrified. By the way, that's one of the great sidebars of God's grace. Guess what grace destroys? Fear. You see, when God touches your life with grace, do not fear. There's no longer fear involved. You see, that's the problem. I mean, that's the whole idea behind so many religious activities. If I can just do enough, otherwise I'm afraid, why well, do enough? Grace comes in and says, don't fear. There's no reason to fear here. That's true. So, he said, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul. And you'll eat at my table regularly. What? That has to be how it, What? No, no, I'm not going to die. No, no. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to restore all the land of Saul. Now, just think about this in your mind. He was king of Israel. Do you think he owned a few acres? He said, I'm going to give you all that land. And by the way, I'm going to have you come to my table to eat. The only people that eat at the king's table are very invited dignitaries and his family. No one but family eats at the king's table. <laughs> he says, he prostrated himself and said, what is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? I don't get it. By the way, we never get grace. You see, you can't ponder it. Because we know you get what you deserve. You get what you earn. Someone gives, bestows grace on you, and it's like, I don't get this. I just don't get it. And notice what he calls himself. And by the way, this is not a time when the AKC was prominent. People had little fluffy pets. Every time in the Bible you use the term dog, it's derogatory. I'm just a dead dog. Wow. The king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, all that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him and he shall bring in and you shall bring in the produce, he said, so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. That's just one of the servants, Ziba, but he's a very wealthy man himself. And Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord, the king commands his servant, so as your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's son. Wow. Hmm. Just an amazing story when you think about it from that point of view. 
Mephibosheth is nobody. He's of no consequence to David. He's crippled on both feet. He has absolutely nothing to offer to David. And David bestows grace on him. The grace given, give grace. It's an amazing thing when you think about this. Could you imagine what this was like? Let's just go down the road a few more years and it's dinner time in David's palace. David sits at the head of the table. Off to his left, here comes Amnon in. Amnon is a clever and very crafty son of David's and he sits at David's left hand. Right beside him is Tamar. She's beautiful. She's a beautiful woman. Next, on the other side of the table, comes a really brilliant young man. His name's Solomon. He's the heir apparent. He comes in and he sits down. Beside him, maybe that handsome, raven-haired Absalom. These are David's children. And then you hear shuffling. Or maybe someone carrying somebody. Here comes Mephibosheth. Think of that picture. It's an absolutely amazing picture. Do you think Mephibosheth understood grace in a way that no one else in that world could have ever thought about it? I'm wealthy beyond my imagination. I have tons of servants. I eat at the king's table. I don't deserve any of this. A couple weeks ago, I said, we are all Barabbas, waiting for justice, and Jesus Christ comes in and dies in our stead. We are all Mephibosheth. He's a picture of us. We have nothing to offer God. We are the recipients of his grace, his hesed. We have nothing to offer. We live in a barren place called sin instead of low to bar. We are adopted into God's family. Hmm. We're treated by God as a son of God. All by grace. And at the table, guess who you sit beside? Abraham, Moses, David, Paul, James and John, Mary. They sit at the, and you sit there. <laughs> All because of grace. Please, I challenge you this day to remember one thing. The grace given, give grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these stories. Thank you for the pictures. Thank you most of all for your grace. The unearned, unmerited favor of God. We are all dead dogs. We have all sinned and fall short of your glory. And yet you have bestowed grace, not just to forgive our sins, not just to give us heaven as a destination, but to adopt us into your family as children of God. We are overwhelmed by that. Father, I'm afraid often we are much better at receiving grace than we are of giving grace to others. And so I pray that each of us challenge our own hearts this day and say, am I withholding grace? Am I seeking justice? And when I relate to people, Father, thank you for this profound truth that the grace given give grace. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
that saves the lost and wearied soul, making soft heart of stone. Life once broken is now made whole. There is no greater love. There is no greater love than this. Love that cleans a sick and sinful heart by His blood. Forgiveness bought Night and light Where once was dark There is no greater love There is no greater love Than this There is no greater love There is no greater grace But no other name and rescue you from the grave forever I will praise the only one who saves with a greater love there is no greater love than his love that gives never gives up faithful to the work begun, steadfast and failing in all he does. There is no greater love, there is no greater love than this. There is no greater love, there is no greater grace, no other name. With a greater love, there is no greater love than is. Lord, show me how to love the world around me. With a selfless heart and grace about me, that all may see, that all may know, no greater love. the cost to seek and save the weak and the lost with selfless trust I bear my cross there is no greater love there is no greater love to give there is no greater no greater grace, but no other name can rescue you from the grave. Forever I will live to tell the world of Him and show a greater love, and show the greater love of Jesus. There is no greater. There is no greater love than is. There is no greater love. There is no greater love than is. The grace given, give grace. Amen.